Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever you're listening. This is Davisville on KDRTLP 95.7 FM in Davis, California. We live at kdrt.org online. I'm Bill Buchanan, and I thank you for tuning in today. You've probably heard a lot about bullying the last several years, but today we have new information about the subject. The University of California, Davis recently reported that most teen bullying occurs among peers climbing the social ladder and the highest rates of bullying occur between friends, and between friends of friends, as if junior high weren't difficult enough. Here today to help us understand this research is Bob Ferris, a professor in the university's Department of Sociology and expert on the subject, and the author and researcher of the information that we are talking about today. We'll also talk about what to do with this information. Professor, thank you for talking with us today. Sure thing, happy to be here. So in layperson's language, what have you discovered? Well, um, we have long suspected that a lot of bullying behavior is not kind of a pathological reaction to, you know, emotional trauma or problematic home environments. So although, of course, some of it is, but that a lot of it is actually, you know, instrumental behavior intended for social climbing. So kids are, are being aggressive towards their rivals. So if that is true, we started to suspect, you know, the next question is, well, who are their rivals? Who are they targeting? And we came to the conclusion that if, if this is, to the extent that this is instrumental behavior, they should really be targeting their own friends because our friends are also our rivals when we're talking about questions of popularity. They're they, they the ones that adolescents compete with for valued social positions and relationships with higher status peers. So that was the hypothesis we tested. And we examined rates of aggression between friends and, and friends of friends and compare those to rates of aggression between other schoolmates who weren't either friends or friends of friends. And what we found is that is a um, really strong relationship. The highest rates of aggression were between friends. Friends are between three and four times more likely to bully each other than non-friends. And friends of friends are twice as likely to bully each other as non-friends. I've read some of your research to prepare for this. And I have to say, I was very sad to learn this. Bullying anyone is bad, but you know, I'd like to think that friends don't abuse each other. Yeah, I would like to think that too. And, and I like to think that, that as adults, maybe they'll forge stronger friendships that don't in, in involve those kinds of betrayals. But yeah, unfortunately, during adolescence, there's a lot of churn and kids are figuring out social status and they're competing for it. And it, you know, involves some collateral damage along the way. And friends, of course, have lots of ammo, ammunition. You know, they know things about each other. They know their, each other's weak spots and, and secrets. So there's yeah. a lot of potential for damage. And social media is a, a factor in this too, right? If I understand correctly, uh, the kind of behavior you're describing has always existed, but that social media makes it more prevalent, uh, more pervasive in a student's life. Yeah, I think it amplifies these dynamics in several ways. One is that it just blows up the audience, potential audience for someone's humiliation. You know, in the, in the past, the worst case, the worst thing that could happen would be like, say, to get tripped in the in the cafeteria, you know, the scene we always see in, in movies. Your schoolmates see that and laugh, but on, on social media, it's not just, your, that, that could, has the potential to be seen by thousands and thousands of people. And also it's never forgotten. It's, it's always there to go back to and to circulate. And so you, you can never move past, like it's the, the reput your reputation becomes even stickier. These things follow you uh, in a way they didn't before. It, it amplifies it another way in that it, it sort of extends the school day. So, it, you know, it used to be that a kid would come home and, you know, I used to get bullied when I was young and, I, you know, like the, the trip home was very treacherous, but at least when I got home, you know, it was safe, right? But now kids come home, they get right onto their various social media platforms and they, you know, a lot of them are experiencing some awful things. And so it, there's no break from it. And the third way it kind of distorts, amplifies and distorts things is that it, it sort of really strongly rewards and reorients kids 
toward social status and maintaining and curating a, a, an image for which they have a scoreboard. I mean, they have likes, they can count, a lot of these things are countable. And so they can, they can kind of keep track of each other that way. And, and that, and, and they become more and more oriented toward, toward their social standing at the expense of, I think, yeah. their relationships. Are the, uh, the students who are doing the bullying, are they aware that they're doing this? I mean, are they doing it consciously, deliberately? I think most of the time they are. You know, kids are, you know, they, they, speak, they speak a different language and they, they see things like, I look at some kids, when I was really investigating the social media aspect of this, you know, we talk to kids and we look at, I would look at their social media profiles. They gave us access to them and I wouldn't see anything. But then the kids will explain, they give you a kind of an insider's view of what's going on in this picture. Well, I didn't get tagged or so-and-so didn't get tagged in this photo, was left out of that. And that's a slight. Or, you know, like this in this photo, this kid learns that her two best friends went to go prom dress shopping without her and didn't tell her. So there's a lot of subtleties to it. And I, I tend to think that most of the time, of course, some of it's going to be inadvertent, but most of the time kids know what they're doing. Maybe they don't know how much it's going to hurt, but most of the time, they, most kids have some sense of what the implications are going to be for the, for the person left out. And the, uh, the recipients of this bullying, they're, they're aware of what's oh, yeah. going on. Yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's painful. And they, you know, even, they tend to interpret it as intentional, even if it were inadvertent. So it has, it has the effect of, you know, regardless of what the bully or the perpetrator had in, in mind, the you know, victims in these scenarios view it as intentional. And so the experience is, you know, for them is, is more or less indistinguishable. So, you know, you were talking as we were getting ready for this, that you have a, a different view of bullying as a term. Because, I mean, one, one way to, you know, as you say, students don't call it bullying, you know, maybe they call it drama. So I guess that creates a question back for you as a researcher as well. If they don't consider it bullying, is it really? But, but I think your point was that bullying is one way of talking about what is really abusive behavior. Do I have this right? Yeah. For a long time, the, the, field, of, of, of the, the field that has both sociologists and psychologists and people in education who are all studying bullying, the kind of consensus definition of of a scholarly definition of bullying was that it was intentional harm doing perpetrated by someone with more power over someone who was defenseless and that it was repeated over time. And that to me, I have several problems with that definition, but one of the biggest ones is, is that requirement that it be repeated. I'm aware of lots of, you know, I'm aware of several more than one suicide that was instigated by you know a single rumor, a single thing that ha event. And of course, there's always precursors to you know suicide is not a, a never has a single cause, but you know the apparent inspiration for it for at least several suicides it was a single in incident, not some ongoing bullying relationship. So for a while, I, you know, I tried to back away and didn't didn't try and resist. I called what I was studying. I called it aggression, or I, you know, I use different terms, but that doesn't really capture, you know, being a victim of aggression doesn't really capture the experience very well. And the, and the term bullying is so powerful that I've gone back to using it. And I'm just trying to redefine it because I think when kids experience the kind of cruelty at the hands of their peers, that that fits the profile. And I'm less interested in whether it, it fits in that existing box or not, but it's, it, to me, it seems like bullying and it has comparable amounts of damage for the yeah, victim. It, you know, you, you read the last few years about anxiety levels among teenagers, young teenagers, perhaps particularly, although other ages as well, increasing. And as I listen to you, I'm thinking, well, this sort of gets at the heart of that, doesn't it? I mean, you're talking about people very focused on their peers, very focused on status, broadcast, as far as they're concerned, to the entire world, which is to say that the people that they know, that's a hard area to navigate. I, I guess yeah. this, has, this has always happened, or at least it's happened for quite a while, but really it's social media that amplifies it, like we were talking a while ago. Yeah, I think it amplifies it, and it, 
extends it to a 24 hour period. But the underlying dynamics, I think, are the same. Most, you know, what we found was that the vast majority of cyberbullying events were between kids who knew each other in real life. And it continued, and, and, and it wasn't just happening online, it was also happening at school. So I think it, it amplifies and extends rather than, you know, being some completely different, you know, qualitatively different um, dynamic. You know, uh, in a moment, we'll, we'll talk about what maybe we can do as parents, friends, teachers to combat this. And I know some of your research has been that the current anti-bullying efforts don't really work. And you have some thoughts on, on why that is and what to do about it. I do want to talk a bit more about the, the research. The, uh, the results that you've found, do they apply regardless of gender or affluence or, or race? Yeah, we tested to see whether these fundamental processes, whether the higher rates of aggression between friends are, you know, differ by race, gender, and other demographic characteristics. And we pretty much find that they don't. With one exception, if you think about, you know, these kids were asked, they were only given two options in terms of gender, and, it, and that's a shortcoming of this, the study. It was originally collected a, a long time ago in the early 2000s. but what we found, if, we look, if you kind of array the four gender options dyadically, what we found is that the highest rates of aggression were, were from girl to girl, followed by boy to boy. And then boys pick on girls much more often than girls pick on boys. And so the upshot is that, you know, what we find, because we have a very broad understanding of bullying, we find that boys and girls are equally likely to be perpetrators, to be bullies but they're both disproportionately targeting girls. And so girls are much more likely than boys to be the victims of these things. And, and I dug into that a little bit further and found that it's not just all girls, it's actually really concentrated among girls who have started to date. And I think it's a reflection of both, you know, the competitive dynamics of the romantic, you know, the dating of dating life among adolescents and the kind of drama that can arise from that, but also it's also a reflection of the sexual double standard that that girls face in um, most American contexts. To, to hear that, your heart just has to go out to any girl that age, nearly. I mean, to to live with that is just yeah, sounds grim. It, it it is it is very tough. A couple of things. So this study has been going on for a while, right? Uh, goes back, I think you said, uh, twenty years, nearly. Yeah. So. The these kids, when we started this study, this is a large community-based study that was conducted in North Carolina, three different counties. So every kid uh, who was in public school in those three counties in at the beginning, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade were eligible to participate and they were followed for four and a half years. So all the way into and through high school. But that's when we the data collection stopped when they graduated. So we don't know where they are now. They are now in their early 30s. And so my hope is that we'll, uh, at some point, be able to put together funding to try and collect a new wave of data collection of, of data from them to see how they're, how they're doing and how their adolescent experiences are, have, may have affected their adult lives. Boy, that sounds like that would be pretty valuable. If, if this is a group that were really studied when they were younger, you would have a lot of data you could build on. Because that was one of my questions too, is do you get a sense that these students particularly the ones doing the bullying, do they regret it later on? Do they grow out of it? I would like to find that out. I know anecdotally, I'm aware of a lot of, um, you know, there's some, I saw an article just yesterday about a person who was a victim of bullying in her younger years and went back and interviewed all of her, tried to interview all of her classmates, including the bullies. And they expressed really profound profound remorse. Like it, it, it clearly, they were carrying a huge burden of guilt. My dad became friends with this guy who went to his high school. They didn't become friends until after high school. But when this guy was in high school, he was, he was a bully. And by the time their 20th reunion came around, he said he couldn't go. He, he was just too uh, ashamed. He couldn't face the people he had tormented. So uh, yeah, it creates, it creates off, it, it scars the victims and it creates burdens of guilt, or at least it should create burdens of guilt among the bullies. And it's all driven by the, this pursuit of something that is so ephemeral, you know, popularity in high school, high school is going to end so fast. But yeah, but of course, when you're, in the, when, 
when you're in high school, I mean, you might know that intellectually, but maybe you don't feel it emotionally. Yeah, and it's the only thing that matters is is yeah. where you know is fitting in and 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 rising above. We are talking with Bob Ferris, a professor in the uh, University of California Davis Department of Sociology and an expert on bullying, and we're talking about his latest research on this subject. I'm Bill Buchanan, and this is Davisville on KDRT in Davis, California. Well, Bob, let's talk a little bit about what we can do with this information you're finding out. One of the things that you say is that current anti-bullying efforts don't work all that well. And I'm, I'm wondering what it is about them that doesn't work. That's a good question. We don't really know the answer to that. There's probably a hundred different or more different programs that have been implemented in, in various school districts around the country and many more, of course, in Europe and, and elsewhere. Very few of them have been rigorously tested, you know, assigned to a randomized controlled trial and evaluated. And of the few, you know, I think it's safe to assume that the ones that have submitted to that kind of evaluation are probably among the stronger types of programs. But of the few that have been evaluated, we find the majority do not work. Some even make things worse. So they actually have higher rates of bullying than the control schools that had no programming at all. And of those of the, the minority that do work, most of them work, you know, very modestly. There are some exceptions. There are some programs like the program that came out of Finland that is actually probably the most successful program. And it's, you know, it reduces bullying on average between 40 and, and 50%. But one, what, what's interesting is that, you know, and I think what's going on, the reason why these programs are not successful is that because bullies are rewarded. So they, they're gaining or they can gain status and prestige for their behaviors. And that's, it's really hard for a school assembly to compete with that. The programs that we're talking about have tactics like, uh, like school assemblies or bystander uh, programs, right? To try to get students uh, to step in and, and stop bullying when they see it or things like that. Are those the tactics that aren't working? Well, it, it's, it's hard to say whether it's the, the, you know, I think there's nothing wrong with these approaches, I, you know, it does seem to me, you know, somebody who's familiar with the literature on bystander interventions, it's very difficult to get adults to intervene in situations that are not threatening. And so these programs are pinning a lot on asking teenagers to get to intervene in situations that are threatening, and potentially dangerous for them. So it's great if they, they're able to do that. I just feel like that's asking a lot of kids. And, you know, a lot of the programs are, you know, work on empathy training, Kind of solidarity exercises, you know, identifying bullying. There's like teacher components to it. There's a kind of a whole school climate. You know, there's restorative justice type programs, and these are all these are all good and worthy things. It's not clear whether the you know the program it's the it's what they're doing, or that's not working, or it's that they're not doing it long enough or extensively enough. You know, getting fidelity to the program and 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 implementing it throughout, not just for a week, a bullying week or whatever, but implementing it through the course of a school year. There's a often a, there's a, often a lot of mismatch between what they say they're going to do and what actually ends up happening. Like sometimes it turns into just bullying week, which doesn't really gen generally have much effect. So that that's the old dilemma of that if you want to change things, you actually have to change it. You have to integrate something, you not just talk about it for a week or two and then move on to the next subject. Yeah. And I, I, frankly, I'm just not surprised that, that they're as ineffectual as they are. I mean, because kids are, you know, what can, you know, how can adults of anti-bullying program compete with the allure of status? It's, it's if kids, so long as kids are getting rewarded for these behaviors by their peers, I think they're going to engage in them. And in fact, you know, this program I, I mentioned, you know, this Kiva program, it's the most successful program, but they have figured out that there's a group of kids who are effectively immune to all of their, everything they're doing, which are, are the popular bullies, who are the kids who have you know, benefited from these behaviors. Sure. I mean, it, it, at some level, in an amoral sense, they're making a decision, right? They're saying bullying works for me. And they don't think of it as bullying. And that's, you know, yeah. get back, circle back to the term. They, 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 they don't think of themselves as bullies. They don't think what they're doing is bullying. Part of what these programs are trying to do is like actually help kids to see what it is and to identify this as bullying. 
So how do you disrupt that? How do you make it so it doesn't work? I think you've talked about friends, quality of friendship is a factor here. Yeah, so some of my other work, so it, so the big, the big problem is that bullying programs, anti-bullying programs are not working because kids are being rewarded for it. So how do you disrupt that? And I think the implications of our research point to in two different possible directions. The first direction is to sort of, you could call this kind of a realistic view where you accept that kids are always gonna have social hierarchies. There are gonna be some kids who are more, have higher status than others. Um, and that's just sort of the way it works. But what you could do is try to redirect those hierarchies toward more pro-social and more pro-social directions. And that's the approach being taken by uh, there's a the, Israel's largest anti-bullying NGOs named it's called Matzmehim, and their approach is to bring in sort of young college age people trainers who come into the schools and they do a lot of exercises that sort of drive a, a little bit of a wedge between the idea of being popular and the idea of being liked. And because what we find is that a lot of kids you know, who are particularly bullies are popular, everybody recognizes that they are popular, but also privately, most kids don't like them. But a lot of times they don't really realize the emperor has no clothes. And so they, they don't realize how widely disliked those, those popular bullies are. And, and so there's some highlighting of that without calling anybody out individually. But mostly what they try to do is, is really showcase and elevate the kids who make other kids feel supported and, and helped and, you know, help, help these other kids develop yeah. and grow. And so they, they try and really boost those kids' profiles. And so that's, so they're trying to, you know, just redirect the status hierarchies in, in ways that favor kindness rather than cruelty. The second approach is based in, and I'm not, I don't know which one works and, you know, potentially both could be well, not mutually exclusive, but the second approach would be, you know, to ironically, you know, Ironically, given that friends are, we find that friends are more likely to bully each other than non-friends. But really what I'm also finding is that friendships are also the, they're both the problem and the solution. And what I mean by that is that uh, what we find in our research is that, ki is that ki adolescents typically have really low quality friendships. They're very unbalanced. So if you ask a kid to name their five best friends, on average, only two of those nominations are gonna be reciprocated. So that's a sign of unbalanced friendships. But we also find that these friendships turn over very rapidly. So six months, they have a whole new, six months later, they have a whole new set of, of so-called best friends. And we see this also even on two-week intervals. So there's a lot of churn in their social relationships. But what we have found is, that, what I have found is that kids, there are some, a small subset of kids who do maintain stable friendships over time. And these kids are better off on everything you could, that we have data for. They're less likely to engage in dating violence, less likely to be delinquent, less likely to drink, do drugs, less likely to experience anxiety, depression. They do better in school. They're just better off on every single measure. And importantly for our purposes, they are less likely to engage in bullying. And what's interesting about it is that these, their values are different. So they're less likely to engage in bullying because they're less likely to care about popularity. And, and what we see is that the longer that they maintain a, a stable friendship, the importance for them of popularity goes down and the importance of having close friends goes up. And those two different value orientations uh, reinforce those friendships. So they have a tendency, you know, the more they care about having close friends and the less they care about popularity, the more likely are, they are to maintain those friendships over time. So it's a really po a positive cycle, reinforcing cycle of where their, their relationships are reinforcing their values. They, those kids are, are, are out of the fray. Yeah. So as parents, as teachers, as friends, we should be encouraging solid friendships among our children. Absolutely. And, and they're important, you know, it, it, kids need to learn what to expect from a friendship and how to be a good friend. And I don't think they get, nobody teaches them that stuff. Is that something you can learn from a parent? I mean, I'm, a, I'm aware of the age differences. You know, when someone's 13 or 14, your parents can seem pretty out of it, pretty old school, even if they're not. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we have to try. But we also, I think schools can do more to, I mean, schools, um, you know, in America, the traditional high school 
unfortunately reinforces these hierarchies. Stereotypically, they celebrate, you know, football and cheerleading. You know, those are the, or, you know, substitute men's basketball or whatever. You know, some schools have strengths in different areas, but there's, there's typically one activity that gets a lot of the school's attention and resources. And it usually is some boys sport and then, you know, followed by cheerleading. And so schools do, you know, they, they reinforce these pyramids wittingly or unwittingly. And I think they could do more to flatten that, that landscape and provide, I, you know, you know I, elevate I, the, the, pro, the, and create more opportunities for kids to make, make these kind of friendships that are interest-based, you know, that yeah, are not. But, well, and those pyramids become more of a problem if, uh, students have shallow friendships, right? I mean, I suppose if you had a bunch of students that had really solid friendships, then that status would recede in importance, right? Because the students yeah. would say, yeah, I don't really care. I'm not on the football team. I've got my good friends. Absolutely. So that, that's kind of a way to, to look for some kind of a way to improve this, I guess. But anything else that just comes to mind that a parent or a teacher, someone can be doing if, if they've got a kid who's in that age group, and it's probably suffering from this at some level, it sounds like. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really difficult. I mean, we, we want, parents want to want to be able to do something and help their kids and some, it's, it's very tough. I do think one thing that I would suggest based on this research that parents do is help their kid forge friendships that are outside of their school. Because when, when things turn sour at school, they'll have a, somebody to turn to. They so I get back to that idea, some place that it's not to say it'll be off social media, but at least it'll be a different sphere. It yeah. won't be the school. Yeah. Well, thank you, Bob. This has been really an interesting half hour to talk about this. And boy, the work's important. You have a website, right? RobertFarris.org. Yep, RobertFarris.org. That right? That's F-A-R-I-S. That's right. And uh, you've got more research there and things like that that people can go to and read more about this. Yeah, links to all my papers, um, as well as uh, some media coverage of them, which does not include any equations. In it. <laughs> all right. Well, Bob, thank you for talking with us today. I really appreciate sure. this. Thank you for having me. We've been talking with Bob Ferris, a, a sociology professor at UC Davis and an expert on bullying about his latest research on that subject. I am Bill Buchanan. This is Davisville on KDRT in Davis, California. Thank you for listening.